first of all, how have you been? Fine, thank you. Um, really, I am in no position to complain. Uh, okay. We're safe and comfortable, and, and everybody's just fine. How about you? Yeah, good. I mean, have you been like super productive? I know some people are like, I've finished ten scripts I have wanted to work on, or anything like that. Is that have you been like that? Well, I don't like those people very much. Uh, <laughs> um, I've I've been okay. I've I've done all right. I finished a couple things. I focused a bit more on on original stuff because you know the deadlines are more relaxed, and if you don't get anything done for a few days, you can forgive yourself. So. I owe one rewrite that I ought to get to, um, but you know, generally we have two. I have two older kids and two younger kids. The two younger ones live with us, and you know, I don't know if you have kids in your place, but it's uh, the online school thing is it's challenging. So uh, it's a little it's a little distracting around here. But yeah, I have done I have done some I have done some good work. I think. Uh, we working on novel two because I was a big I'm a big cold storage guy over here. So oh thanks. You know yeah. we were geared up and that when when COVID hit and we had to shut down, um, we were about to start prep. We have a director and uh, Paramount wants to do it, and we were about to go, and hopefully we will soon. Um, but yes, I got another novel in, in the works. I wrote a um, you know I wrote another prose piece that that's going to be an Audible original. Uh, Kevin Bacon also read. He just recorded it last week, so that's that's coming out this summer. But oh, that's uh, great! Yard work. Okay. Um, I've been I've really been loving the prose. That was writing that book was just a great experience. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was an annoyingly well formed first novel. It was like, how is this his first book? But yes, everyone should go read this book. It's wonderful. Well, first novel, but after thirty years of writing, so that's you know, true. That's true. You know, <laughs> I had warmed up a great deal. It was pretty. It, it was pretty delightful to be able to write, to uh, to to be able to write what a character was thinking or feeling. I didn't realize how constraining screenwriting is to just what they see it say and do. You know? Yeah. Well, and I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about some of your earlier movies before we jump into this great new one. Um, David uh, uh, Brian De Palma recently talked about how. Carlito's Way and Mission Impossible were the highlights of his career. Um, and I wanted to know what your experience was on those movies and, and sort of what your take was. They were great. Brian and I have stayed close friends uh, uh, ever since. He's, he lives just a couple miles away. Uh, we have socially distanced coffee from time to time. Um, he's, uh, uh, they, were, they were, well, they were turbulent. Um, the the of the three movies I did with Brian, uh, the only peaceful one was Snake Eyes, but I think the other two are stronger films in part because of the the the, the chaos and fighting and friction. Um, you know the the old expression "bad experience, good film," uh, good experience, bad film, um, and the uh, so I mean I loved them. They were they were really. It, they were really fun. And even though there was fighting, I always felt Brian and I were allies. Uh, even when he fired me, had to fire me and rehire me on Mission Impossible. Um, he just the other day said, you know, I think I was the first person to ever fire you. I said, yeah, Brian, so, you know, <laughs> so what? You came back, didn't you? Uh, it was, uh, but they were, they were great experiences, yeah. In the documentary, he talks about how you and Robert Town were in different hotel rooms in the same hotel working on different drafts of Mission Impossible. Did you know there was a guy next door working on the same? Yeah, they didn't okay. even go to the same hotel, actually. Okay. Uh, he was in the Dorchester. I was in the old Hyde Park Hotel, which is now the Mandarin. Um, but he, uh, yeah, it was, it was really stressy. Um, once the movie got up and running, uh, or once Paramount greenlit it, uh, Tom got rather anxious and wanted to bring Town in to work on it. And then Town came in and Brian didn't want, you know, there was a lot of fighting. Um, and then uh, Town came in and sort of threw all the pages up in the air and things stayed quite chaotic. And then three weeks before shooting, they said, will you come back and, you know, try and put it all back together. Um, but uh, Bob's going to keep working. Uh, and you're going to keep working, and we'll just figure out what we shoot. And I was like, okay, this ought to be 
this ought to be interesting. Has there ever been a, a situation where the movie was just too chaotic or the script was in such disrepair that you said, I can't do this? I mean, I've always been, I, I've, I've always been able to find an appropriate moment to leave if I needed to leave. I never had a dramatic leaving. Um, I think, you know, sometimes, and I think I've gotten better at it as, as I've gotten older. Um, John Camps and I wrote Zathura that John Favreau directed, and Favreau really wanted to take a pass at it himself. We didn't want him to, so it seemed to make sense to to leave and you know let him let him do that. But which I think he was about to implement anyway. So you know, I'm not sure if I if I walked out or was shoved, but um, it's fine, I guess. You know, you gotta sometimes take your own shot at stuff. I didn't want to let that go because it had a lot of my two uh, sons in it. So, you know, I, it was a lot of personal stuff and I didn't want to leave it to somebody else. So I think I probably threw a hissy fit on the phone as I left. But um, uh, other than that, you know, you kind of know when your time is up on a movie. Okay. Um, and because it usually if you get fired or if you quit, it's because it's not because people are unpleasant, it's because you're out of ideas or your ideas just aren't gelling with theirs. And it's kind of a relief, actually. Right. Uh, one of the movies you wrote, which is one of my favorites, is The Shadow uh, from a while ago, which feels like a Preston Sturgis superhero movie or something. But, <laughs> nice of uh, you to say it. <laughs> what was your experience on that? And, and were there ever talks of like coming back and doing another one or, or was that sort of it for that property? That was kind of it. I don't think it made enough money for, for, for there to be another one. Uh, I'm kind of surprised they haven't tried again. I mean, they have over the years tried to get it going, but they never made one um, because it's such a cool old property. It's, it has the invisible man problem. You know, how do you manifest somebody you can't see? Um, but uh, it, was, it, it was really stylish. That was a, there was a lot of... There was a lot to be said for that movie. It was kind of bananas. One of the highlights of my career, though, was one day watching Jonathan Winters improvise. Um, you know, none of it usable, but he just, there was a scene in the Cobalt Club, and, uh, you know, Lamont comes in and sits down, and Winters just goes off for like a page of stuff. And it was hilarious and fantastic, not in keeping with the rest of the movie, but it was Jonathan Winters. It was crazy. Did Raimi ever bring up the shadow to you when you guys were working on Spider-Man? Because he had wanted to do it for years. Yeah, I think we've talked about it once or twice. Uh, okay. But I think we, he went and did Darkman, which you know, right. may have had certain overlap with yes. the shadow. I don't know. Legally dissimilar uh, shadow. Um, Not in a legally actionable way, mind you, but, you know. <laughs> Are there any of the, the franchise that you worked on, whether it's Jurassic Park or Spider-Man or uh, Robert Langdon, uh, that you would like to return to or think about sort of subsequent chapters in? Not really. I mean, <clears throat> you tend to get, I, I feel like I haven't done a lot of sequels in my day because I guess I've done a couple, but I feel like you use all your best ideas the first time. And I know in the lost world, I, you know, we worked really hard, but, um, and I think there's a lot of great stuff in it but it just doesn't have the advantage of novelty the way the first of anything does. So <clears throat> um, I don't think, I, I enjoyed both the Robert Langdon ones, but you know, I had a book to work from both times. Um, and the, everybody on those is just so delightful to work with that it was just really fun. Plus you get to go to Florence and Rome and cool places. Um, in terms of, but you know, I, there was a time maybe seven or eight years ago where I was going to come back for a couple Spider-Man movies after they'd done their first amazing Spider-Man. And I'd had, on the very first Spider-Man, I'd sort of planned out what I thought the first three movies should be. And then all the assorted personalities, it didn't work for me to keep, keep writing the Spider-Man movies. Again, jumped or pushed, who knows? And um, uh, so I came, so I was excited to come back and try to finish the story I'd started telling in the first one and, and as we were about to agree that I was going to do that I, I pulled out all the old stuff and I'd started outlining those two movies and and then I thought boy that's you, you can't go home again that moment has passed the time when I was really feeling it was 10 years ago and there's no point trying to 
trying to recreate it. So I bet. Well, do you remember what you were planning for the subsequent Raimi Spider-Man movies? Yeah, it was a, it was a, basically it was the tell, the telling of the, the Gwen Stacy, uh, you know, Harry Osborn story, but I, I spaced everything out differently. Um, and you know, I, I, I wanted, I wanted Gwen to be killed in the, in the middle of the second movie, uh, because that tends, you know, it's following sort of the Empire Strikes Back model. Um, and, uh, you know, I had different villains I wanted to use and just a different way to tell that story. Well, you were on, I don't know if you were still on Indiana Jones 5, is that? Not more. Um, okay. When James Mangel came in and I, you know, he, he deserves a, a chance to take his shot at it. So I, I'd done numerous or several versions with Steven. So when he, when Steven left, it seemed like the right time to, you know, let Jim have his own, have his own take on it and his own person or himself to write it. Right. Well, well, after that one comes out, we'll have to talk about what your version was going to be like. Um, you also were involved with The Mummy and wrote a Bride of Frankenstein, right? Yes, that's currently, um, that was one thing I did during the quarantine is I, I came back and finished, uh, brought Bride of Frankenstein into a place where I would kind of always wanted it to be. Universal was very gracious to let me try again because they geared up and shut down famously in the sort of dark universe fiasco. Um, or not fiasco, disappointment. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I have a version now, and they have a version that we all really like, and I think they're, they're uh, talking to some directors about it. Is it the more sort of scaled down Invisible Man model of it? Or is it still... Uh, really yeah, it's not, the, it's not the great big, you know, $150 million dollar extravaganza with giant movie stars it is definitely it's not quite as scaled down as invisible man you know but a, a much more reasonable doable doable thing with i think a really cool idea and it's all present day oh, okay were you were you supposed to shepherd the dark universe at all or did they talk to you about that uh i don't know you know i've worked with universal for a really long time and um they, they send me stuff and ask for ideas and everybody you know, and I'm, I'm happy to consult and everybody, we were all trying to pitch in and make something out of that. And, uh, you know, uh, not all ideas work out. <laughs> <laughs> to their credit, uh, what, I, what I really admired about Universal is they threw up their hands and said, whoa, hold on, hold on. This isn't working out. Let's stop and just think for a year or two. And um, I thought that was really smart. And, you know, big corporations don't often do that. Um, say, you know, there aren't a lot of new Coke moments where they, where they say, this was this, not as we hoped, we're going to stop and go off in this other direction. Right. But so, thankfully we have that, we have that photo to look at for the rest of our lives. Thank God of all the actors photoshopped. Uh, yeah. yeah. From different places photoshopped into one. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, you're, the movies that you choose to direct definitely have their own kind of feel, but the last, Mordecai was the first one you directed that you didn't write. Did that experience sort of inform what you were going to choose next to, to direct? That experience, yeah, that, that experience was a rough one. Um, in my defense, <laughs> and I understand you weren't attacking, you very gently uh, brought that up, but I appreciate it. Um, look, if uh, there was a Brian De Palma said as that movie was coming out and clearly was about to be, you know, a disaster, just a, you know, commercially, critically, financially, personally, physically, you know, in every way it was about to be a disaster. And Brian put his hand on my shoulder and said, you haven't lived till you've had a major catastrophe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he said, I should know I've taken down two studios. So, uh, uh, yeah, that that informed a lot of my choices, and I think um, uh, you know I can't blame anybody else for that movie not working out. I think it was a lot of people working together, making choices that just didn't work. But I also think, and this is the in my defense part, that if you don't have one or two major catastrophes, you're not trying hard enough. You're not mixing it up. And I've always, I've always tried to work in other genres and work at things that I might not be good at. And I think it's safe to say I, I found one 
uh, with that. So, so afterwards, um, I did, if I did direct again, I wanted something small. I wanted something that I really felt. I want something that, you know, kind of grew out of me and I wanted to work with people that I, you know, knew and loved. So that's what I did. Well, uh, you know, you said that the panic room, uh, house is based on your brownstone in New York, uh, is you, the, the house and you should have left based on your phantasmagoric Welsh manner. <laughs> I wish I had one. Um, no, I grew up in, um, for, I, I've been doing, you know, crazy weird stuff happens in your house stories for a long time. I really yeah. love them. Uh, the domestic front is a place, you know, that, that, uh, I, I think is Rosemary's baby is my favorite movie for a reason, you know, cause scary stuff happens at home and among those you love. Um, where I, I grew up in rural Wisconsin in the seventies and, uh, there was a place called the wonder spot, which was, you can Google if you're curious. Uh, but it was this house that was built, it was just kind of, somebody built a house like into a hillside or on a slope and they built the house wrong so that on purpose, so that if you look at it, it looks normal. But if you stand in it, you're, 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 you appear to be standing at an impossible angle. And if you put something down in the middle of the floor, it rolls the way, exact opposite way that it should. And water seems to flow the wrong way. And it's, it's all an optical illusion, but as a kid, that was where I always wanted to go. Uh, I always wanted to go to the wonder spot to the point of, you know, bugging the hell out of my family. I'd be curious to see it if it still existed because I'm sure it's just a house somebody built crooked to try to get a few dollars. But, um, but so I've always been fascinated by that idea of things that you can't trust and, you know, that the, that something in the house leads where it shouldn't and that there's, you know, even in, in cold storage, the idea of this beeping and you open up a wall and you find there's a thing behind the wall and then you find there's other levels behind it. Um, those are great stories, both um, literally, you know, in storytelling sense and metaphorically that there's a lot underneath that you don't know about. Right. Um, I, I love that stuff. What was, is this pretty close to the, the novella that it, that's based on, or is this mostly a, a David Kep invention? Uh, well, it's both. I think it's, it's, it's certainly in the spirit. The characters, I mean, the character in the novella is, a, is, is not only a writer, it's even worse, it's a screenwriter. So that, that had to be changed immediately. <laughs> Nobody needs to see that. Um, it was fine in a book, but not a movie. Um, so, you know, it's still the, the marriage with, uh, you know, secrets and the little kid and the house in the middle of, in, in this case, it was in Germany because the author's German, but um, very much in the same spirit. The, the novel's very thin. It's a, it's a, it's a novella. I and mean, Daniel really worked a lot of mysterious stuff with it. And he was very happy to leave a lot of questions unanswered, mm -hmm. um, which works fine in a book, but tends to piss people off in a movie. Right. Uh, had you and, and Kevin wanted to sort of do something together since Stir of Echoes, which is just such an amazing sort of collaboration between you two? Well, oh, thanks. Um, yes, we have. And, you know, we've, a couple things have come up over the years. I can't believe it's been 20 years go by. But we never, never quite found the right one. And uh, we started talking, but, we, but we've been close friends, which has been even better than working together. Um, but we started talking a couple of years ago about wanting to do a small movie in the Blumhouse model. Um, and we had some, and we wanted it to be about a marriage. We wanted it to be in, you know, an isolated location. Um, and we had some ideas that we were working with. And then uh, Kevin, this book came out and Kevin came across it and read it and said, you're not going to believe it. It's, it's like our movie. So we optioned the book and, and went from there. You guys shot it a while ago. Um, can you talk about the decision uh, uh, to sort of just surprise people with it and say it's coming out next week? Uh, well, it wasn't, yeah, a bunch of events interceded, you know. We right. shot it in, I guess, uh, fall of 18. And we were done with the first cut in, you know, March of 19, last March. But we wanted four days of additional shooting because uh, we had some other ideas. And, but we had to wait six months because Kevin was now doing City on a Hill and had a big mustache. Right. So, you know, digitally removing the mustache was problematic. Just ask him 
capital and we didn't have that kind of money. Um, so we had to wait six months to do our reshoots. Then we did our additional shooting, finished it up. Everybody was really happy with it. And we were discussing how it would be released. And then COVID hit. So we just, we'd actually finished the movie weeks before, just a few weeks before COVID hit. Oh, wow. Well, it sort of works though too, because it's, it's sort of a surprise for everybody. You, you aren't going to have months of buildup to it. Is, is there something to, I mean, do you like this, this model of sort of springing it on people? I love it. I mean, okay. it depends, it depends on the movie, of course, you know, it, it helps that if it's a $5 million movie, um, yep. you can, you can, the, the pressure is so much less that, you know, you can do this and it seems like you don't have to also, what I, I love not having to fight against, you know, a Marvel movie for, a, for a release date and, right. you know, to try to beg for a $30 million ad campaign just to get noticed. Um, I think obviously I love movie theaters and I love going to movies and I, you know, I want to go to movies the rest of my life in cinemas. Um, but I also think this is a, this is a great way to release movies. I know I'm excited. If I turn on the TV and I see on, you know, iTunes or Amazon or whatever, wherever I'm going, new, you know, like new movies coming out to rent, I'm really excited. I've seen some great stuff on Amazon in the last couple of months that I never would have come across otherwise. Right. Uh, see The Vast of Night. Yeah, it's so good. Isn't it great? It's so good. Yeah watched that the other night i mean and that's a movie i think they found it at slam dance they didn't make that right no no it was an acquisition i think they, that was another one that was done for a little while too okay. right and that never would you, you'd never find that otherwise it would not go to movie theaters you know and and uh, anyway i was i thought it was great well i mean but, so is, I'm there excited. Any, uh, is there any appeal to to make a bigger budget movie i mean would you would you ever take on uh, some kind of tentpole movie or franchise movie yourself? Not as a director. I, I, I love them as a writer, okay. but you know, I, I'm not really for someone who's directed six or seven movies, seven movies. I'm not temperamentally suited to directing at, at all. It, <laughs> I really like being, I really like being in a room alone and writing or, you know, with John camps or, and working with a, a talented director um but the directing is just brutal i mean it's it's physically and emotionally difficult under the best of circumstances and if things start to go bad it's you're just besieged i i, I feel so bad for directors and every time i do it i do it because i love talking to actors and i love editing and occasionally i'll have a story that i feel like well i'd like this to be the way i see it um and every time I do it, as soon as I start, I, I, I'm riding around in a scout van, and I think, "How did I get myself into this again? Why have I, why have I done it?" So, which you know, you can't really complain about to people. You know, woe is me. I have to direct movies every once in a while. So, uh, so yeah, no good answer to that that question. But no, not a ten pole movie for me. Thanks. Okay, uh, we can't talk about what the sequence is, but there's an amazing sequence that I'm assuming took a lot of, of editing sort of towards the end of the movie. Um, can you talk sort of vaguely about what it was like putting that together? Cause that, that seemed like it was, it took a lot of work to get sort of figured out. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> yes. And I'd love, after we finish, I'd love to pick your brain about a couple things uh, okay. just to see how they struck you and when. Um, but the, um, yeah, I mean the movie, the, the, the movie as a whole, was really tricky to figure out. And we wanted to do, there are obviously some very cool things that happened in it, and we wanted them all to happen practically, um, as opposed to with, uh, you know, CG. Uh, or, I mean, there's a tiny bit of CG trickery, but the, the, we wanted to, and we only had 26 days to shoot it, and then four additional days. So, still not a great deal of time. So, it, it called for a lot of planning. And, um, it, it, you know, the house itself, even before the sequence you're, I think you're referring to, uh, just moving around the house itself, there are, I think, 30 some different doorways. And, you know, we have eight hallways and corridors, and they don't lead to the same place twice, you know. Right. So you have to, even just planning what color is this door on which side, 
<laughs> so that it lines up properly because next time that door might open into a different room and that has to work too. Um, there, there was just, there was a, I remember there was a battle plan of doll, hallways and doors that we listed and, you know, laminated and had to carry around with ourselves and remember so that things all lined up. So um, the sequence you're in called for a, a lot of really just very crafty cutting okay. and, um, and then trying to match movements so it looks as though you're watching an uninterrupted sequence, which, uh, which of course, like all movies, is shot in tiny bits and pieces, but in this case, even more so and which required a lot of um, actors changing their look. And that was, uh, that was tricky. Was it hard to explain to, to Kevin yeah. where he was? <laughs> okay. It's hard to explain to people. Um, yeah, Kevin would occasionally come over to the monitor before a take and say, is this the second time I ran upstairs looking for or the third time? <laughs> I said, second time, first day. Because you run up again three times the next day. He's like, Right, okay, got it. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that's tricky. Uh, but he, he figured it out, I'm assuming. He, he, knew he did. It. Okay. Yeah, he was great. And there was also a lot you figure out in, in, in editing. There's a, a relatively brief sequence where he tries to get up a staircase and it just doesn't work out for him, <laughs> and, uh, like Sisyphus. And um, that alone, the number of times that guy had to run up that staircase in different states of fatigue and that we slammed him back down to the bottom again was, uh, was kind, of, kind of sadistic on my part. Thank God he looks like he's the most in shape human being on earth and could handle yeah, it. Yeah, he really is. However, it doesn't matter how good a shape you're in, you really can't fall down the stairs that many times. <laughs> <laughs> Turns well, out you once or twice is about the limit. This movie plays with a lot of sort of dream imagery. Uh, did you take any of that stuff from from dreams or nightmares that you've actually had? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would, you know, anything I wake up with, I, I jot down. Okay. And um, and then when your head's in it, you know, if your if your head's in the right writing space, you should be dreaming about it. Um, right. I always, as I'm finishing a draft, the last few days of anything, the last few days are really terrible because because I it's just going all night. So I tend to wake up at three and write down a bunch of stuff. And, then, and since this is a lot, a lot of this movie is about your subconscious. Um, that that was especially appropriate. Um, I, and obviously, there's a lot of fear in our subconscious. And if anybody's got children, fear for and about your children is is predominant. Um, right. So I think there's a reason that, you know, in the very beginning of the movie, there's a sequence where the character is trying to meditate, and that's a message to the audience. You know, a lot of this is here. Try and figure out which parts. There's a great moment where you sort of use that as narration for for uh, what's going on, on on screen. And was there any more of that stuff at, at one point or another? I mean, was there sort of more of that voiceover throughout the movie? No, we used, I, I think I might have had one additional sequence okay. uh, where we had, we had that, but it was, um, it, it was, we cut it for pace. It was, it turns out hearing someone meditate is not the most, you know, compelling <laughs> cinematic action you can possibly see. Well, David, thank you so much for, for chatting with us uh, about this movie, uh, which is now Probably when this video is up, we'll, we'll either be right right before it comes out or, or right as it comes out on VOD on every major platform, I think. So uh, thank you so much for, for chatting with us. My pleasure. Nice to see you.